Hey everyone, um, thanks for hanging in for three days. Um, it's been a really fun event, so thank you to everyone who helped uh, work on it. As somebody who's been on a conference planning team, I know it's a lot of work, so good job to all the planning team. Um, so we get a lot of questions um, about why we use, um, map, uh, wh why we're involved in um, OSM. Um, and the very simple answer is that we actually use OSM in our products. So how many people have seen a Maps product in one of the Facebook family of apps? Okay. <laughs> I want to say that's 50%. So you've definitely seen that little map pop up either in your checking stories, messenger location, um, Instagram places. Um, there's now the marketplace uh, to sell and buy things. So there's lots of different um, functionalities and, and apps within the Facebook family that use maps. Um, so if, you, if you've seen it, then you know that we're predominantly a display feature. And so while we're not an exact product within Facebook, we do support a lot of the products who need a map surface. Um, so last year when we talked about OSM, uh, we mentioned that we were rolling out. Um, and we were in about 22 countries, and these are the countries um, that were running on OSM. Um, and we're happy to say that in the last six months, we're about here. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's been a very interesting time. We've been going nonstop, uh, long, crazy hours. We've had a lot of good successes, and we, we've also had some challenges because you don't know what you don't know sometimes uh, when you're doing it for the first time. Um, but it's been really fun, and I'm going to talk about kind of our dynamic within the team and how we've split things up. Um, so these are our two streams of work that we focus on within Facebook. Um, this is our QA work, and the very technical term, remove bad stuff team. Um, so that's one of the streams. Um, and we're going to go into more detail so you can see things with pictures. Um, and then we also have our second stream of work, which you guys are probably familiar with based on the last talk. And we call this the add good stuff team. Um, and so basically you can see the top one is more about quality um, and making sure that the, the map that we use is free of vandalism and we do a lot of work there to try and understand what's going on in the base map so that we can uh, use it in different places. Uh, we have more than 2 billion users so anything that is on there is definitely visible to a lot more people. Um, and then our add good stuff is our AI-assisted road tracing, which is basically using machine learning to help us do things a little bit faster. So we'll go into some more detail there. Um, so you can see based on the icons, we do a lot of searching, and then we have a validation process, and then eventually we have like a final checklist. Um, so let's talk about profanity. This is something that we're obviously super concerned about um, because I don't think we have a full grasp of everything that's in OSM, especially because of the different lang uh, languages that render in different locations. Um, and also, it's just a really hard problem to tackle because there's no one full database of all of the bad words that could p potentially be in there. So first we started with creating a list of potential profanity. So this meant scouring the internet for bad words. Um, so if anyone walked past my laptop, they definitely saw some weird stuff on there. Um, but then we also have a lot of integrity teams at Facebook that focus on these kinds of things and lots of language support. Um, so by asking p teams to kind of go through and fill these lists for different languages, we ended up with a list of about 39,000 words um, in 43 different languages, which I know is not completely comprehensive, but it, we felt at least a little bit safer for what we were looking at. And then secondly, we went through and validated against this dictionary of words um, throughout the OSM PDF file. And what we found was that we found 84,000 flagged words. Um, so while we do have an editing team, this is still a lot of words to go through manually. So we started doing some filtering. And so if you think about some of the words that could show up on an integrity list, some of them actually might be uh, shops, in the, uh, shops or restaurant names too. Um, and so we did some filtering so that we would eventually have a much um, smaller list that we can actually manually QA and then look at words that are more contextually based. 
So then we ended up with about 2,000 of these, and we manually checked them. Um, and what we were super happy about after all of this, especially seeing these numbers, that there was only 139 of them that were true positive, so actually bad words. Some of them had been in there for about five years, but because they weren't maybe the language that was rendering, they probably weren't flagged manually. Um, so we went ahead and fixed those in OSM. Um, this is a little bit about our team. So in addition to having the resources of always asking uh, within the wider Facebook network of language support, our actual editing team speaks these languages and have lived in different places. So we make sure to hire diversity, uh, not only um, from places, but also languages, so that when we're queuing these things, people are from the countries that are there, so they have much better context on what we're looking at. Um, this was the map just to show, before we filtered it out, what the profanity looked like across um, the world. And you can see that there's a lot more in English. That's because our list for, obviously, English was much larger. But then there's a lot of false positives in here. So I, you know, I want to like make sure to, to mention that this is not all of the bad words and not representative of how vandalism occurs. But it's just the first thing that popped, us to, uh, popped up to us. Um, the next thing that we do with the OSM data is we also run OSM chat. So we picked about 33 of the most, um, I guess, important features that Facebook cares about in the display functionalities um, and kind of went through and we manually QA'd every single of these in about 90% of the world. Um, and so we, we pretty much like had the entire team um, and we did like a hack month and all we did every single day was go through OSM oh, chat and bad words. Um, the, the nice thing about this is that if you see the total counts for what it flagged as a potential issue versus the red line, which is the actual issue, um, which in most cases is l less than 50%. Um, so that also helped us feel a little bit better because we, were then, we then knew what we were working with. But then there's still a lot of other types of vandalism within um, OSM that we, we weren't quite sure how to look at. Um, so we decided to use some optical character recognition. So this is uh, also um, support that we have for within the Facebook infrastructure. Um, and to be able to do this, we actually removed the labels from uh, the PBF file and then ran it on the raster maps using these different um, training data sets, and because X-ray is usually horizontal, we did a couple of augmentation uh, data sets to be able to see them in different views, and so we can catch things that are different angles or upside down or reverse. Um, and it picked up all of them, and so we've also, that also helped us feel a little bit better. Um, and you can see over here um, kind of the words that it's, it's, the letters it's picking up, and then the detection confidence. Um, right over there. And this is one more example. There's, there's quite a few of these. Um, if you look at the OSM cha or some of the um, talk lists, you'll see a couple of that. The, the other thing to, to point out is that in the, in the case where there was labels, it was a lower confidence. Um, so it was able to recognize um, through size and shape its different zoom levels what we were working with. So that was pretty much it on the vandalism stuff can definitely go into more detail later. Um, now for the adding good stuff, uh, the machine learning roads um, that finally get into OSM. As you can see, we have our ML data model, um, and then we add training data, which we create ourselves, coupled with the DG imagery, which is pretty much the same one that's in OSM and available to everyone. Do our road predictions, eventually we get some vectors, um, we get a raster map that we turn into vectors so that we can merge it much better because it's now the same file format as OSM. And then we have our editing team uh, go through pretty much every one of those tasks and it finally gets into OSM. So before we started doing that, uh, and I think I've shared this map before, but just for reference, this is what your road coverage looks like in OSM. Um, so your more developed countries that are blue obviously have a lot more road coverage, but the minute you get out of these areas into more developing nations, um, it starts to get less and less. And this is kind of the areas that do need more help, especially remote teams, because it's much harder to map on the ground. So think about the conditions that people are in. Um, you're dealing with like no Wi-Fi, really crazy uh, terrain conditions, um, not good technology. and so. We, we feel like this is important to us because it helps uh, connect people in those areas. This is an example of one of the raster outputs. 
Um, and you can see, based on the yellow, that's our population density, which I'm also going to talk about a little bit later. But it, the white is the roads that it's picking up. So we create our own data sets, uh, training data sets in-house with our editors. And these are basically examples of the types of training data sets these are. And simply, this is in Photoshop. We just draw out every single road. And so the machine model can get a sense of the different textures, colors, and widths that it needs to look for within the entire country. Um, and as we go through, we also validate uh, the results that are coming out to see what it's missing. And then we can create a more specialized data set if we need to and add it to the model. Um, this is the raw output, um, and basically the darker it is, that's the more confident, uh, the confidence of what it's picking up from the machine learning, and so you can see a different thickness in the roads. And using the same example, which is an area in Indonesia, you can see the post-processing steps. So we apply a really th high threshold as soon as the output is completed to make sure that we're super confident that it actually is picking up roads, which kind of throws away the roads that we're not confident about, which is why this image particularly looks more fragmented. And then we extract a center line from this image. Um, and then we go through the more lower confidence areas and we trim out um, roads and we connect the lower confidence areas. And low confidence areas doesn't usually mean there's no road. Um, but if you look at satellite imagery, there's going to be areas where the trees are covering or there's shadow or there's some greenery. Um, and, and there is most likely a road on the ground. Um, it just has a, a kind of a block um, with, through the road. We then go and remove the island roads, and this is the same concept. Usually these island roads actually do exist, but because we're mapping in more rural areas, so, uh, so far it's been Thailand and Indonesia, and we're starting from the outskirts moving into the city, um, this is areas that have a lot of greenery. So they tend to have a lot of these roads that are seasonal, and they change, and there's greenery, and it all moves around. But for the sake of getting it into OSM, we want everything to connect into the major road network, um, and so we take them out. Um, this is what it looks like when it gets into ID. Um, so this is actually four different tasks uh, that would be put together. And you can see we have some color coordination um, and styling that we do there to help our editors figure out exactly what they're uh, mapping and what they need to focus on. Um, so this is the tasking manager. We've used the hot tasking manager that's available open source. And we've added a couple of things that make sense for our, the way our team works and the process that we do. Um, and so you'll see we actually have three editing steps. So we have an editor, a reviewer, and a publisher. So every single tile that goes into OSM is actually viewed by three different people to make sure that nothing is getting in there that might not be um, good data. Um, we've done some logic building into the tasking manager. Because we're dealing with roads, we prefer people don't edit right next to each other. So when you pick a random task, it tries to pick different tasks. Um, we have uh, like a note section so you can review and, and leave notes to the editor. So that if there's any training gaps, we can fix that right away. And then we also have the ability to read the files that are right next door. So a lot of the times, you don't want to work in just the zone that you're editing, and you want to have context for the full picture. But we don't want the ability to edit any of that data, because it could belong to a different person that's doing a task. And so the read-only file helps us to view these files in an uneditable way that gives the mapper more context. Um, we have a ton of quality analysis in this step as well. Um, we've customized the ID editor, so we've added a ton of hotkeys, and there's a little video next that'll help explain what this is. Um, we also use JOSM for our full project review, so once everything's live in OSM, we also go through and do like a whole other review process. Um, and then we use a lot of the open source tools like OSM, Cha, Osmos, and KeepWrite. Um, we, these are actually built into our tasking manager, so they go through the editing process. And if we find any of these errors, it actually shows up as a task to our editors, and they can go through and um, fix those up. So this is the ID. It's actually on OSM Labs. So if you wanted to use it, it's there. Um, but we've built uh, validation checks. So these are very similar to JOSM, um, except it's right within ID. Um, and it goes through each of the lintings. And so we ba basically doesn't let you go to the next step unless you've fixed all your issues. Um, and we've done some custom road styling because that helps our editors kind of see things a little bit more clear. It helps us with hierarchy, um, helps us to make sure that things are split and uh, merged correctly. 
Um, so there's a couple of uh, different features in there. So editors constantly make requests for things they're doing a lot. And so each time they do that, we have a feedback loop and we're able to go through and make the changes that they're looking for. Um, we have things like, you know, toggle through the hotkeys, toggle through um, satellite imagery so you can look at uh, different types of imagery um, going through much easier than you would, um, you know, clicking all the icons. So this was for Indonesia. Um, you guys do know we were working in Thailand. We've also been able to share some of the ML vector data with partners. Um, so this is for Mexico, and we ran the same model that we used in Southeast Asia and Mexico, um, and we're able to get pretty decent results. So this was uh, a city in Mexico. Um, it is not an OSM. This is just uh, sample data. Um, we then also have something similar for Uganda that we shared with um, NGOs. And you can kind of see very similar results, so it seems to be doing pretty good. We tried something very new for our work in Indonesia. Luckily, there, was a very, there is a very strong community um, in Indonesia between humanitarian OpenStreetMap and local Indonesia. Um, so we were able to try a different model this time. So we actually shared our vector data with the local community um, and went over and did a training and opened up our tools for them to be able to do that because it helps us, they're the local community and they know the area much better. So this, this seemed like a really good model for us this time. Um, and basically how that went is we spent the first three months just cleaning up Indonesia. So if anyone's ever seen it, there's a lot of misalignment, um, some digitized roads that may have been done a few years earlier, and so things were looked a little bit differently. Um, some were not digitized so great. So we went through and spent about three months just cleaning up the entire country. Um, so this was both teams at Facebook and um, in Indonesia, and we used uh, both the Tasking Manager and Map Roulette to find and fix these issues. Um, we then did an in-person training and went over uh, with our QAs and engineers to basically help um, start up and, and coordinate around the local mapping. Um, and we got a lot of, we learned a lot as well about the tagging scheme and how locally everything is done, how they're tagged, uh, which really helped us also figure out like how we should um, work um, there versus how we were working in Thailand because it's a little bit different. Um, and so far they've been able to complete 4,800 tasks. We also do a lot of ground truth uh, with the local community. Um, so this is things like validating what's on the ground, um, confirming different types of roads and, and uh, tags and types of bridges. So Wulan is going to be doing an awesome talk next about the details of ground truth, so stay to hear that. Um, and she'll talk more about the experience and what it is they were validating um, and how it worked with the, the roads we were producing. Um, the other thing we're focused on is crowdsourcing road names. Um, so with Facebook, we have a ton of uh, places data that's already in our system. We also have a great card. Uh, we have a lot of users that are very engaged in crowdsourcing and answering questions. Um, and so what we've been able to do is um, make calls out to local people, and if, we are, if there's two or three places with the same street name on the same road, we will ask back and have them confirm what the name is, and we'll get a confidence rating based on that. Um, in Indonesia, we ran it for about, uh, I think, 10 days, and we were able to get 176,000 confirmed names for streets. Um, so this is something that the local community will be able to... Um, confirm and then also put back into OSM. Um, so how much mapping is left? So I get this, com I get this uh, question quite a lot, is like, we're gonna map out everything and what's left? The answer is like quite a lot of data. Um, the one constant uh, is that there's always change and so a map is going to be con continuously changed in addition to some of the geometry that's missing, there's always gonna be place movements, changes, um, you know, as people move. So uh, one of the data sets that Facebook has released is the population data sets. Um, these are open data sets that you can find on season. Um, and the process of doing this is very similar to how we're extracting roads from satellite imagery. Um, this is actually for buildings to get a better sense of population and areas. Um, this is examples of India, Madagascar, and Mozambique, um, and the images that uh, from there. Um, basically, how does this help mapping? Um, so 
we've been able to share this with a lot of NGOs, and one of the primary use cases um, across the World Bank, Red Cross, Humanitarian Open Street Map, um, Doc Doctors Without Borders, was being able to identify specifically areas of population. So instead of saying, hey, we need to map this entire province, we can narrow down on the areas that have a lot of bu buildings, which makes the entire process more efficient. Uh, when you're dealing with like limited time, limited resources, uh, this is a much better way to get coordinated faster. Um, so in the case of this, um, this was part of a health initiative, uh, the measles and rubella initiative in um, southern Africa. We're, we're not that used to hearing about this maybe in the US um, or uh, Europe, but it's quite a big deal in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, so basically how this works is um, volunteers will go through um, door to door talking to houses and, and making sure they're informed about the health benefits or health um, information that they need to know. And so the Red Cross was able to do this in Malawi. Um, they created 58 mapping projects based on the population density focus areas of uh, where people were. Um, and volunteers around the world, and this was remote tracing, were able to add a million buildings and almost 120,000 kilometers of roads. Um, and this was done by about 5,000 remote traces that probably weren't even in Malawi. Um, and this allowed about 3,000 local mappers in Malawi um, over three days to go through and talk to uh, 100,000 houses. So they went door to door and were able to be more efficient about how they spoke to people. Um, in the Facebook use case, uh, we're starting to look at ways that we can um, get quantities for what, how much of the world is mapped and do it by feature type. Um, so this is an example of the population density in Mexico. Um, and you can see the heat map, basically everything from purple to yellow. Yellow means there's more people living in that area. And, and since we have a sense of how many people are in that area or the populations in that area, we were wondering if we can kind of merge this together with some of the OSM data plus our ML roads to see exactly how much further we need to go to at least be somewhat complete. So this same image with um, the satellite imagery background so you can get a little bit more context on the area. Um, and we, we were able to kind of uh, do this and normalize it against a, the machine learning roads we've produced. So um, basically comparing what's in OSM versus what we've produced against the population data. And this gives us a really good indication of very specific tasks that need more work for us to be able to say that we're completely mapped that area. Um, and so if you were doing a project, you could make high priority areas or be more specific about um, what it is that was left to map. And this is normalized uh, from zero to one. So zooming in a little bit, this is what it would look like. Um, so you could see the different, the same color codes of areas that already have data versus what's needed, um, and the same against the imagery. So what does that look like? Um, if we look at an example in Uganda, for example, um, this would be at 80% uh, of 80 of the population being mapped. This is what it would look like compared to how many people. Um, at 90%, this is what we end up at. At 95%. And then finally, at 99.5%. Um, and so you can see there's a much longer way to go. And so it, it helps us put that metric on how many people are mapped against a certain feature type uh, much easier than um, other data sets. So what's coming next? Uh, we want to focus on improving vandalism so that we could you know, run more checks, do them faster, or be more efficient. Um, we're always adding more features to the open source ID. Um, and we're also looking to uh, find ways that we can share the vector data more easily. So when partners come to us, uh, we're not putting it in our Dropbox, but there's like a more efficient way to share that data. Um, and if you guys remember, we showed a little bit of the Thailand progression from the last year. Um, and we've had great community support, and we learned a lot from continuously communicating with them and learning how to tag and we're able to go through. And I'm going to really quickly show um, a video of what that progression was.
Thanks to Steve for the interesting talk. A question with respect to the validation data. Would it be possible for you to flag change sets just like Mapbox does it in OSM car? Because it's not so, I mean, I assume that you fix the stuff anyway, but by flagging the change sets, we get a history of a person's work. And mm -hmm. in the cases where it's just an accident, it doesn't matter. But if we have systematic vandalism, it makes it easier to detect if we know that the change sets are bad. Yeah, absolutely. So this was our plan. Um, this was the first time we've rolled out or done any kind of check. So our idea was to get a sense of what's going on. And then we definitely want to open that up and flag it. Um, one of the things we had a conversation with the other people that care about validation um, was how can we put it in a more coordinated space and so that people don't have to go to multiple tools to look at different types of validation. And so our hope is that we can plug into one of these systems and so that it's much more easier for users to go and see what's going on. But yeah, absolutely. I got the mic first. <laughs> um, so you talked a bit about how you're working with the community and particularly using HOT um, to work with that in certain countries. But um, So I'm from the UK and I've noticed you're using uh, OpenStreetMap in the UK now. So I wondered us as a community, as individuals in that community, but also our local chapter, um, how can we help Facebook and support how you're using the maps and what you're doing? That's a great question. Um, so we're always open to coll collaboration. There's, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you can always reach out to us, um, get on a call, email, whatever. Um, and if there's any way we can support each other, we're completely open. Um, right now, I just we're also learning what it means to have OSM be on Facebook on such a large scale. We're actually it's happened in the last few weeks, to be very honest. Um, but you know, as we all learn more, we're completely open to collaborating. Hi. Hey. Um, I wonder. Hey. <laughs> I'm here. Hey. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so Facebook uses um, various uh, databases, uh, geographic, geographic databases in its services. So Bing Maps, uh, here, OpenStreetMap. Is there any, lo what, what would be the, the perspective? Is there any long term plan to, uh, to have a, a single um, s uh, data source? Or um, would it be always like collaboration of, uh, of data sources? Uh, so I think the, the world map is interesting that some, some places are just better on certain places. So I imagine, you know, at least for the, the near future, um, there's going to be different data, different pieces of the data that comes from different places uh, based, based on what's just best at that time. Um, but we're very focused on OSM within Facebook. We've put a lot of resources and time behind it. And we like the open culture. It's, it's very similar to the culture that we have um, at the company. Um, so we'd like to keep uh, pushing more and more res uh, resources and time into OSM. Hi. Um, I understand that you do not publish the raw data from your machine learning for the roads as open data directly. We know that Microsoft did a different approach. They published the whole data. So my question to you is, why do you not publish the original raw machine learning output as open data? Um, it actually is open. So on our wiki, it's, it's available on, upon request. Um, so it, you know, if you just drop us a line, um, we'd be happy to share it. It, it, is, it is open. Um, sorry, also just to add to that, so what was open with the masks, what we're trying to do is open the vector data, which is more usable. And now that the ID tool helps with all the validations, um, it, it's a much more um, better union of getting that data into OSM, should you choose to, because you're getting both the tools and the data. Yes, all the change which are displayed on the screen have been done by a single account. No, account? no. Uh, they've been done by like a group of, of team members. So if you actually look at our wiki page, we've mentioned um, everybody that's in our team, and all of our user profiles also say they work for Facebook. So you can see by chain set and by user, everyone okay. that um, has been adding data. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for your time, and I think. You